So I got up this morning, got the boys off to school, came into my office, got down on my knees to pray like I always do. And the next thing I knew, I was face down on the floor, bawling my eyes out, soaking the carpet with my tears. I must have prayed or cried for a good 30 minutes. And yet I hardly said anything. All I could do was weep. It's been a rough couple years. You know, following Katie almost dying from sepsis a few years ago, she's had this ongoing battle with infection, internal pain and bleeding, which they can't figure out, by the way, and regular iron infusions that make her feel just terrible. On top of that, the trials and demonic attacks that our family has gone through over the past couple of years with our children has been debilitating at times. And now over the last few months, we've been losing clients like a tire that's slowly going flat and you ain't home yet. And now on top of it all, I recently fell down the stairs, landing on my shoulder, and it'll probably need surgery. I'm not sure how we're going to pay for that. But yeah, times are tough all around for a lot of people I know. And here's the thing, there are times when you just don't know, you don't have any words, and you don't really know what to pray anymore, and all you can do is cry. Well, I guess today was one of those days for me. When I was done, and my heart was finally quiet, I was just lying there, face down on the floor, and like, the best way I can explain it is like a gentle breeze. The loving grace of God came over me. And suddenly, and all at once, I saw all the times that God had come through for me. Time after time, when it seemed like there was no hope in sight, God was there. I saw him walking with me as a little child, protecting me and leading me as I slowly felt my way towards him. I felt the love that he had for me and how heaven rejoiced when Jesus saved me when I was 19. He showed me how he had always been faithful, even when I was not. How he waited for me so many times over the last 36 years when I got sidetracked by sin and self. He was always waiting patiently with open arms. I even saw myself curled up in a ball in the closet about 11 years ago as he held me in my despair and poured out his healing grace upon us when we had lost a baby. I saw God protecting Ezekiel while Katie and I stormed heaven in prayer for four exhausting hours outside the operating room. I was reminded how he delivered my, my dear wife Katie three times in answer to prayer and fasting as sickness and death seemed to be crouching at her door. I saw how he provided for us financially hundreds of times over the past 23 years, even when we were in times just like this. And in that moment, I was at peace. That peace that surpasses all understanding. It doesn't make any sense, you know? And I thought of Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 through 23, where it says, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 22 through 23. Next, I knew I almost laughed out loud as I thought, okay, after 30 years of walking with the Lord and seeing so many miraculous answers to prayer and after knowing his loving kindness, now I'm going to doubt. After all these years, now I'm going to let fear get the best of me. After everything I've been through walking with the Lord for the past 36 years, now I'm questioning the faithfulness of God? Really? That is why we must never stop clinging to Jesus and to the Word of God. You can trust God. You can trust the promises in this book. I know that you might be saying, you know, that all sounds great, Dustin, but I struggle with trusting God because He hasn't answered my prayers or my life is a wreck and I see no hope of it ever getting better. You might be asking, how can I learn to trust in the faithfulness of God? How can I have peace when my whole world is turned upside down? I'm going to tell you that when everything is falling apart in your life, that is actually 
the best opportunity to learn how to experience the faithfulness of God. And that, that's, the expi- that's the really exciting part. Well, I'll come back to that in just a minute. Because first, our faith has to be based on His Word. Our faith is based on everything that God says about Himself in the Bible. This includes His promises, His commands, and even His warnings. You know, the Bible talks a lot about the faithfulness of God. Psalm 119, 89 through 90 says, Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues to all generations. The Bible itself is a testimony of God's faithfulness with over 300 prophecies over a span of 4,000 years that were all fulfilled by Jesus during his lifetime. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says that God does not change. Yes, we can trust the promises of God as a direct reflection of His character and His faithfulness, knowing that He never changes. But we must walk by faith, not by sight, trusting that God will be faithful. Smith Wigglesworth, an old Pentecostal evangelist, said, I am not moved by what I see, only by what I believe. Now, he loved the Word of God, and he was talking about what he believed based on the promises in this book. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 13, it says that God remains faithful even when we are not. In 2 Timothy uh, 2, uh, 11 through 13, it says, This is a faithful saying. For if we died with Him, we shall also live with Him. If we endure, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. If we are faithless, He remains faithful. He cannot deny Himself. In that letter, Paul was writing to Timothy to encourage him to trust in the faithfulness of God. And Paul was trying to assure him that God's word is something you can stand on like a rock. Nothing can shake it. And get this, when Paul wrote that letter, he was in prison waiting to die. He knew this would be his last letter. Brothers and sisters, you can trust God. The word of God is filled with his promises. That's that's where it starts. It starts with his word. But we can also look back on our lives and see how God has come through for us. We can look, we can all look back and see His faithfulness, even in the smallest things, even when at the time maybe we couldn't see it. That's why it's so important to keep a prayer journal where you can write down your prayers and come back and write down what, when God answers. Actually, in Deuteronomy uh, chapter 8, verse 2, God actually commanded the Israelites to remember all that He had done for them. Okay, what about those who are going through trials right now and having a hard time trusting God? So no matter what you're going through, the good news is that God actually wants to demonstrate. He wants to prove His faithfulness. This is why He often allows us to go through trials and difficulties. Our faith is proven during testing, and that's a good thing. I know it doesn't seem like it, but if God is testing your faith now, Be glad, because wouldn't you rather know now if your faith is going to fail before it's too late? James chapter 1, starting in verse 2, says that we should count it all joy when we fall into various trials because we know that the testing of our faith produces patience. When God tests our faith, He does it to deepen our understanding and our realization of our dependence on Him. Because we are desperately dependent on God even for every breath that we take. But it can be easy to forget that. When, when life is easy and comfortable, we can begin to forget God. So God will sometimes test us to drive us to our knees and in desperate dependence on Him as a way to deepen and increase our faith. But it's not just about proving that our faith is real or even growing our faith or getting a deeper relationship with God. It's also about giving God the opportunity to be glorified in proving His faithfulness. When God tests your faith, He's giving you the opportunity to see Him come through for you, to see Him uphold His promises and prove to you that He is faithful even when you are not. If you were never tested, you would never have the joy of seeing God move and come through for you. If you want to experience what it's like to see God move, to see God come through for you in amazing ways, then you've got to let go of trying to do it all on your own and start trusting God. 
as long as you're trusting in the arm of the flesh, you will never see God move. You've got to let go and stand on the promises of God, trusting in His holy word. Until you let go of your unbelief, and until you let go of trying to hold it all together in your own strength, you will never experience the joy of seeing God work in your life and being faithful. Until you let go of your unbelief and until you let go of trying to hold it all together, you will never experience the joy of seeing God work in your life and being faithful to His Word. And make no mistake about it, it is only God who holds you up. Even when you think it's all your own efforts, it's God. But the problem is, when we focus on us and unbelief, it's much harder to see. We cannot know the full experience of the faithfulness of God unless we take Him at His word and just believe what He has said. But whatever you do, don't make the mistake of thinking that your faith needs to be a perfect God-given faith before you can move forward and do whatever it is that you need to do. Take a stand on what faith you have, and Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, will meet you. You know, in Mark chapter 9, a man brought his demon-possessed boy to Jesus. In verse 22, he said to Jesus, If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus assured him that all things are possible for, for the one who believes. And then the man replied to Jesus, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Jesus didn't turn him away just because his faith was mixed with doubt. No, Jesus healed the boy and cast out the demon. And don't think for one second that Peter had perfect faith when he stepped out of the boat and walked on water. Of course he didn't. He didn't have perfect faith. Only Jesus does. Now, this is just my opinion, but I think it was probably about 50% faith and 50% I'm just going to go for it because I'm missing out on this opportunity. I wouldn't be surprised if Peter just grabbed a hold of whatever faith he could muster up, held his breath, and said, I'm going for it. You see, God is just waiting for you to act on whatever faith you have, and He will meet you. I believe that sometimes we don't have perfect faith. We can make the conscious decision to believe and to stand our ground. And doing that demonstrates a type of faith that pleases God. And doing that will produce even more faith that will be God-given. God honors faith, even when that faith is something that we have to force while gritting our teeth or holding our breath. Brothers and sisters, you can trust God. You can trust God. My life has been crazy. I've seen God do so many miracles right before my eyes in answer to prayer and fasting. So many times He has delivered, protected, healed, and come through for me in answer to prayer where there was no denying it. There was no way you could deny that I had spoken to God and He heard me and did something. And that's amazing. That's, that's great because, because to live is Christ. But brothers and sisters, to die... That's even better because no matter what happens, God is faithful. How do I know? Because God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life. One day I'm going to swing out into eternity on that one truth, trusting in Christ alone. Amen.